Yeah, I was doing Family Ties, and um, we were in, I think, our third season, and we were just starting to actually become successful. And we, we, we uh, it was our first season uh, following the Cosby Show, so all of a sudden it became this one, two punch and kind of this juggernaut for NBC, so the show was doing well. And uh, and actually, in the fall of that year, Meredith Baxter, uh, who was then Meredith Baxter Bernie, was uh, pregnant with twins, so we had to shut down for a while. So we uh, shut down, and I went, uh, I did this uh, werewolf movie called Teen Wolf in, in, in the break. I don't know what, you know what I was thinking, like, you know, that it was a good career move from Michael Landon or something, so maybe I should do it. I, don't, I have no idea why, but anyway, shooting this movie in Pasadena, and these people came by, these location scouts, because it was this great neighborhood where everybody shoots, and I found out that there were location sh scouts for, for this movie called Back to the Future that Stephen was going to produce, and I knew Crispin Glover, who was going to be in it, but I didn't really think much more about it, except that, oh, that, that, that would have been a cool movie to do instead of this werewolf movie. Uh, and then, so I didn't think about it. Then I, I went away for Christmas break, and I came back, and I saw Gary Goldberg, who's the producer of, of Family Ties, and he said, I want to show you something, and he gave me the script for Back to the Future. And he said, you know, way back in the fall, uh, Bob Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg had talked to me about you doing this, but I couldn't make you available, and I hope you understand why. And I said, yeah, you know, I did. He said, but now they they want to recast it. They want to put you in it, and um, if you're up to it, uh, I'm willing to let you do it. So... That was it. Cut to, you know, a week later, and I'm doing double shifts. I was doing Family Ties all day and Back to the Future all night. And, and you know, I was completely like a zombie. I didn't know what I was doing, but it, it all worked out. The, the way the Doc Brown was written and the way he was played by Chris and the way it was directed and, and, and created by, by um, Bob was... Um, he was able to, to, to perform a function that any, sto any story needs, particularly a fantasy story or a complicated story like this, which was to get at the exposition. Um, what we call, you know, actors call laying the pipe. You know, no one wants to lay pipe. Laying pipe, you know, in other words, this is how it works. Or, you know, so-and-so said this, and therefore this is going to happen. These kind of storytelling links that have to be told in words that can't be shown visually, that's boring work, you know, and it, it's, it's a drag to do it. But, but Bob was able to, to write and, and then cast that role in such a way that you could get all this exposition out in this amazingly entertaining way. You know, you have this guy go, ah, 89 gigawatts, and blah, blah, blah. It just rattled this stuff out, and it's fun to watch. And at the same time, you're going, oh, wait, I, now I get it. And, and it was, it was tr amazing storytelling and amazing, um, you know, like I said, amazing on the part of Bob for having, you know, visualized and realized and... and, and directed this and also in Chris's playing of it so that I could just, you know, stand there with, you know, look of astonished uh, amazement number 37-B while while Chris rattled out all this stuff and the audience was with, was with us all the way. So it was pretty amazing. You know, I was exhausted. I'd get up at, at uh, you know, 9 or... 8.30, go to, to Family Ties, work until about 5. A car would pick me up, take me to, to the Back to the Future set. I'd work until 4 or 5 in the morning, um, sometimes literally be carried in by the Teamster driver, put into bed, and a few hours later, they'd come and pick me up again and, and turn on the shower, turn on the coffee, kind of shake me. I'd get out of bed, and then I'd be off again, and I'd do that like six days a week. The sixth day, I would just work on, on Back to the Future. Um, so it was really exhausting, and I, and I got a little disoriented. I mean, there was one time, a story that I tell is being at Family Ties on a show night and having an audience there and waiting for my cue and, and running to the prop table, which was back behind the kitchen door on, on Family Ties, and freaking out because I couldn't find my video camera. And, um, and it took me like a couple minutes to realize that it was Marty McFly's video camera. It wasn't Alex Keaton's. I didn't need it. Um, but it was that disorienting so that by the time... Back to the Future came out, um, and I was in London doing a Family Ties TV movie. Um, I could barely remember the experience. I had no idea about what the what the film was going to look like or what I was going to be like in it. Um, it was very uh, it was a big blur to me. So so the fact that it came out and was so well received, and I got so much attention for it, really was a shock to me. I, I really at that point I was just kind of happy to be alive.
Yeah, no, it was great. And I, I just wanted to get back together with those people again. And, and, and I, you know, with those two minds, with Bob and Bob, you know, you, know, you knew there'd be a lot of ideas and, and they could generate ideas for, for a sequel. We, we weren't thinking in terms of two sequels. Um, that really came about because they'd written a lot of the things that happened in two and three. They had actually put in an original script that was, that was a part two. But it was so um, expansive and so deep and, and rich and, and I think ultimately expensive that, that they came up with the idea of making two films. <laughs> I was cured of my love of DeLoreans very quickly, my fascination with DeLoreans. They, um, yeah, I kept, I, what I remember was, you know, they had, they had all these cars and they would trick them out, you know, so they'd get camera angles in different positions. And, um, and yeah, I was always cutting my knuckles up and kind of like that. So I was cutting my knuckles up in the shifter and, and um, I don't really know by the time I got those cars how much they really were like, you know, a, showroom DeLorean um, but you know I, I kept thinking he can never get the car door open you know and you have those gold wing doors that look really cool but if you park next to anything you can't get out of the car so I was always you know kind of trying to weasel my way you know between the the uh, whatever space there was and the door was open so yeah yeah it, not a practical car I can see why it didn't set the world on fire <laughs> The special effects that we did in two were really cutting edge at the time, and I, I don't know how they how they uh, hold up now, whether they're kind of ancient. But um, you, a lot of the stuff we know, and I played all these different characters, you know, and we would. I played Marty. Boy, I couldn't even tell you now. I played Marty's son, Marty's daughter, Marty at forty, uh, Marty the eighty-five Marty. And we'd all be in the same room, and so I had this camera. I think it was called a Tondro or something. And, and we'd shoot it. We had to do it all on the same day in case there was like an earthquake or something and, and the camera moved. So we had to get all those shots in the same day, which meant doing all those makeups and all, all those takes all in the same day. So it would just be this exhausting day of getting into one makeup, getting out of it, getting into another one, getting out of it, and, and syncing up like, so that I could actually like hand myself uh, props. and It was amazingly complicated. And I kind of you know was bummed when I saw the movie because it looked so seamless that you didn't really get how, you know, what an effort it was and how groundbreaking it was. And then with, like, the skateboard stuff, I was working with my friend Charlie Crowell who did my stunts in both movies, all three movies, and he's a good friend of mine. And he, uh, <clears throat> he would devise these, these things, these rods and poles and wires that would go up my back and down my pant legs and all this stuff so I could ride the hoverboard. And it was, it was like Torquemada. I mean... It was, it was extremely excruciating, a lot of these things. But we'd do them to just get the take. And, um, yeah, he, he definitely could have worked during the Spanish Inquisition. There's so many elements of the story that were accessible, but, but Bob was able to make them also at the same time exotic and, and strange. So, so that was the other thing about the movie is so many moments where, where the where the audience were going, oh yeah, I relate to that. I was there. I know what that was. I remember that song. I remember that car. I, you know, I know what that's like to feel that way. But still, it was dressed up in this package that was really new and exciting. And that was definitely a real feeling of 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 uh, you know. It was in a way, it was this big production that was really expensive and. Um, and, and you know, happen on a grand scale. But it also had this real kind of Andy Rooney, let's put on a show in the barn feel to it. You know, it really had a feeling. We, you know, we weren't, we had Stevens blessing, obviously, and Stevens uh, producing it, and, and Frank and Kathy, who had a proven track record. But nobody expected it to be that. Nobody expected it to be what it turned out to be. So we, we kind of were like these kids in a candy store. I mean, we really, and, and it was such a great team, and we all cared for each other a lot. And, and, and knew we were part of something and really wanted to, like I said with Bob, wanted to do it well for each other. You know, didn't want to let anybody down. You watch Chris 
Glover or Chris Lloyd in a scene, and you don't want to go in and stink up the joint when you go to do your work because you just watch them be brilliant. And that kind of connected feeling all the way through. Yeah, I don't know that it exists anymore like that.